Hello, this is Mark Sheffield. Welcome to my channel, The Literary Professor. If you enjoy my content, please like and subscribe. Today's topic is about the true nature of English grammar. A lot of people have little confidence in their own grammar for some reason, and I'm going to try to help you today understand more about what grammar is actually all about. Every time I tell people that I'm an English professor, they will be embarrassed. They will say things like, oh, English was my worst class, or my grammar is terrible, and things like that. And apparently, I just might bite their heads off. Well, I would like to help you get over this kind of feeling. I would like you to understand that if your first language is English, your grammar is perfect. That doesn't mean that you never make a grammar mistake with your own particular rules from your own region of the country, because nobody is perfect with grammar, not even English professors at all. So let me try to use an illustration to explain to you what I mean by uh, your grammar is perfect. My father was a World War II combat medic in Germany. And when the war was over, there was not anything for these soldiers to do. It was pretty boring. But uh, the United States Army gave every soldier two cartons of cigarettes every week. And my father was not a smoker. So in the economy, the American cigarette became the medium of exchange. You could, with two cigarettes, get your laundry done. Things like that. But what my father decided to do was to uh, pay little children to teach him how to speak grammar. And this brings up a very strange thing, is that he would have children, even preschool children, four and five, talk to him in German and try to help him to learn German. And in fact, he learned a lot of German from these children. Well you might think, well, of course, those German children learn their German from their German parents. Well, if you think that, you're partially correct, but it's a bit more complex than that. Yes, their parents did speak German in the home, and that made the, uh, the children be German speakers. But the reality is, is that every child is born with an intuitive sense of grammar not German grammar or English grammar, but an intuitive sense of what's called universal grammar. That is, every single human being has in the head, in the brain, uh, the right DNA to be a speaker. When you hear this, you probably immediately want to say, I know what you're thinking. What about all those hillbillies in them thar hills? They have bad grammar, don't they? Well, sorry to burst your bubble, but those hill folks speak perfect English just as you do. It's just that their version of English is different than yours. If you wanted to speak like a hillbilly, you would have to train very hard to learn another dialect. Every native speaker is a language expert in this sense, not because of any education that they may have, but because every speaker is a human being. Now, think about this. If you wanted to learn how to weave baskets, do you have an intuitive sense of uh, how to weave baskets? No, you do not. You would have to be trained in order to weave a basket. That's one kind of skill. But language is not like that. Language is more like walking. You are an intuitive walker. Walking is in your DNA as a human being. Now, even though your parents, when you were a child, imagined that they were helping you learn how to walk by giving you certain toys or putting you in certain kinds of uh, playthings that made you kind of walk around, and scoot around, that really doesn't help at all. The way you learned to walk was simple. You started to crawl, you stood up, and then you walked. It's pretty much that simple. The only way you wouldn't learn to walk 
is if you were disabled or if your parents wouldn't let you walk. That's a terrible idea, of course. So, why then should we study English grammar? That's a very important question and worth answering. We study English grammar in order to become more sophisticated with language expression. Because if you're a native speaker of the language, that doesn't mean you are a native public speaker, for instance. To become a public speaker, you would need some training. That skill has to be taught. You are not a, an intuitive reader. You're not an intuitive writer. Once again, you learn those things in school, typically. So remember that English is not in the brain, but the ability to learn any language is in the brain. Think for a second about certain peoples around the world. Uh, I can think of India as one good example, where there are people who live in a multilingual culture, and there are people who probably know three, four, maybe even five languages, I don't know, but uh, it's very, very possible. In the United States, Americans don't tend to learn other languages because our culture is so uh, large that the population is so big, we live on a continent. We're not forced to learn how to speak other languages. So there are millions of people like that around the world. Let's think for a second about birds and how birds learn their songs or other vocalizations. Do you think they learn their songs from their parents, from listening to their parents? Well, that wouldn't be accurate. And uh, I have a good example of why that wouldn't be accurate. The cowbird will lay an egg in another bird's nest. And that is just her means of, uh, of nesting. It's a very strange way, kind of odd. But the reality is that the bird the cowbird raised in another nest by a different mother will never sound like that bird. Uh, that bird, that cowbird, can only sound like a cowbird. So you can't make a sparrow sound like a blue jay. It's just not going to happen. That sparrow has in its DNA the ability to make its vocalizations. When people talk about bad grammar, what they're usually talking about is dialect and usage, or how particular people use a language in reality. The so-called best usage in any culture is that of the most influential speakers in that culture. And this is where the idea of the King's English comes from. Now, you know that Great Britain is loaded with all kinds of dialects. Now, one of those dialects is the dialect of the king or the queen or the royal family. And so it becomes known as the king's English. Now, it can sound to us when we listen to it very, very posh. It sounds extremely intelligent, well-educated. But the reality is, is that dialect is in no sense superior to other dialects. That is, as an expression of the English language. So, people in various regions speak in particular ways in the English-speaking world. And those ways are not inaccurate, incorrect, or substandard, but they can be non-standard depending on the standard. You would have to learn how to speak posh English by studying, and so would I. When television anchors today read the news, they are speaking in standard English, that is the dominant dialect in the United States. Recently, I saw an article in the New York Times about how many actors, when they use a Southern dialect, are not really very accurate with that dialect. And the reason they can get away with this is because most moviegoers don't recognize the difference between, say, a Texan and a Mississippian so all they hear is a kind of a drawl, and this drawl represents for Northerners what Southerners sound like, which is not accurate. The upshot here is that when we talk about bad grammar, we are really thinking about not English. Non-native speakers make true grammar errors. Saying ain't is not bad grammar. 
but it is non-standard, that's for sure. Let's listen to some truly bad grammar, some not English. I have a copy of an actual letter from a Polish immigrant to immigration officials in Massachusetts. It was written in 1914. And I'm going to read some selections from this letter. And you will see here what I'm talking about. The letter begins this way. I'm in this country four months. I am Polish man. I want be American citizen. But my friends are Polish people. I must live with them. I work in the shoe shop with Polish people. I stay all the time with them, at home, in the shop, anywhere. I want live with American people. But I do not know anybody of American. I do not speak well English, and I cannot understand what they say to me. If somebody could give me another job between American people, help me live with them and learn English, and could tell me the best way how I can fast learn, it would be very, very good for me. Perhaps you have somebody here he could help me. If you can help me, I please you. I wrote this letter by myself and I know no good, but I hope you will understand what I mean. Excuse me. And this letter is signed with the initials FN. Now, the first thing we need to realize is that this is not a native speaker. But something else we ought to realize is that he does communicate what he's trying to say very, very well. But he does it in a non-native way. So the grammar errors that we see here are true grammar errors because no native speaker would ever sound like this. Now, you did not think that this person was a native speaker in some other region of the world. You didn't think that. You knew that this person was a non-native speaker. We have a very powerful sense when we're native speakers of the accuracy of a particular language. And that's why language teachers do not aim for native ability in their classrooms. They aim for near native. We can almost always tell when a person with absolutely flawless English is not a native speaker. So don't let anyone berate your spoken English. And furthermore, be careful how you judge the speech of others. It may turn out that you're in the wrong and are just showing a lack of knowledge about language. Don't be that person. Well, I hope to see you again in my next video where I will address another aspect of all things English.